I love to use props, and I love to use illustrations, I like to use videos, but today, we're not going that route. I've got a simple message today, and, you know, I guess I'm, I'm a simple preacher. I don't get too complex. I think simple is better because simple is, I think, better understood sometimes. And so... Today's message is about salvation, and, and we praise the Lord that we had some respond in our 9 o'clock service, but God really wanted me to focus upon salvation today, and so I want us to pray before I go into the message, because if you're here and you don't know that you're saved, you don't know that you're a Christian, I want you to be able to leave here knowing that you know Christ. And so let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you for the worship. God, just felt like we was in the throne room. We just thank you to have that opportunity, privilege, the honor that you've given us to come boldly to your throne of grace. We just praise you for it. And now, God, I just pray that every heart is open, every mind is open, everyone is listening, they're attentive, God, that they're uh, not distracted or hindered, Lord, that they're ready to receive the Word of God for them. I just give you thanks for that, that you prepare every heart in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. God still saves. <laughs> I'm into making the devil mad. I'm in it especially here lately. I believe when you're under attack, you ought to praise more, worship more, serve more I think you should step it up a lot of times we sort of step back and that's one of my failures I'm sure it's one of yours but what we need to do is step forward and we need to step it up I think if we had more counter attacks we might see that we we, we walk less in defeat and we walk more in victory because what because what the enemy wants us to do is step back not step up I think if you would step up in that attack that you're facing today, you might see that the attack is over. You might see that God has brought you the victory in it. And so I'm all about, you know, counterattack. And so there's no, there's no weapon. There's no attack. There's nothing we can do greater against the kingdom of Satan than to lead somebody to salvation. To lead someone into the kingdom of God out of darkness into his marvelous light nothing gives the devil a black eye nothing nothing is better than that nothing is worse than that for him nothing is better than that for us all across the world today there's people giving the gospel you know and that i'm always amazed by that it's different styles of worship different kinds of preachers all but but Christian churches all across the country and the world today are given the good news of the gospel and people are being won to the kingdom of God. And that should stir us up. That should just make us excited. Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that is the church marching forward, winning souls, leading people into the kingdom of God. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. But if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Our first point is this. Righteousness is believed, not achieved. Righteousness is believed, not achieved. Righteousness is not something that we can achieve. I don't care who told you that. I don't care how important they are, the one that told you that. The Bible tells us we cannot achieve righteousness. 
We can only believe God for righteousness. Even Abraham, who was before Christ, who was one of the patriarchs of the faith, he did not achieve righteousness. He believed God, and God gave him righteousness. Righteousness is a gift. We need to remember that. Raise your hand if you've been saved more than 10 years. Raise your hand. We got to remember this. One of the worst things for a new convert, for a new believer, is for us to in some way infer to them or for us in some way to make them believe that righteousness is something you achieve after a while. That you finally get things worked out. That now you finally got your life in order and it's something that I've attained. That's one of the worst things because we, it's not biblical. It's religion. It's self-righteous stuff. It's just flesh. It's just man. It's things that, we, that puff us up. It's things that make us proud. And it's not in the Word of God. We must tell the new believers that just like them, we also receive righteousness as a free gift. And even today, we can't stand on our own merit. If I had to face God today on my own merit, I would be doomed. And you might think I do pretty good. And I might think I do pretty good. But I ain't nothing like God. Jonathan is nothing like God. But God's righteousness has been placed upon my life. Isaiah 45 and 8, I love this scripture. It goes right along with the song Pastor Brian just sung to you. It says, drop down ye heavens from above let the skies pour down righteousness let the earth open let them bring forth salvation and let righteousness spring up together i the lord have created it righteousness is a gift from god that he showers us with it is god's grace it is god's favor it is god's mercy and it's god's love and it's like an ocean and he has poured it upon his people that's why we should be the most joyful people on the face of the earth because we have received his righteousness i get mad just like you get mad if i have a something you know, paul had a thorn in his flesh if I have something I'm fighting with, maybe you got a temper and you're trying your best and still somebody says something and you fly off the handle before you know it and you get mad at yourself and you go before God and you're so mad and then God reminds you, hey, righteousness is not achieved. Righteousness is believed. Trust in my righteousness. Trust in my strength. Trust in my spirit. Look, saving faith is a speaking faith. This scripture says, believe with the heart, confess with your mouth. Now, it's possible to say things without believing them. But you can't believe in Christ without speaking Christ. You're going to tell somebody. You're going to tell somebody. I'm always concerned when we ask for you to raise your hand to receive Christ. And somebody raises their hands and then when service is over, they duck under the pews and they're out the door. you got to tell somebody. When you believe in your heart, man, it comes out of your mouth. you got to confess it. The Bible says it like this in the book of Psalms. The Bible says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. His mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom He hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. When I was little, I didn't understand this verse. I'm like, why is he asking the redeemed of the Lord to say so? Why does God want me to say so? God ain't wanting you to say so. God's wanting you to tell people that you're redeemed. God's wanting you to tell people that you've been rescued from the hand of the enemy. God's wanting you to tell people that you used to be addicted, but God has rescued you from the hand of the enemy. God is wanting you to tell people that used to be strung out and hung out and laid up, but God has rescued you from the hand of the enemy. In other words, once you believe it in your heart, there ain't nobody can make you shut up. You're going to say it. You're going to yell it from the rooftops. People are going to be trying to tell you to be quiet about it. But you can't be quiet about it because He has changed your life, set you free, changed your course of direction, and given you a new heart. You're going to speak it. Look at your neighbor and say, you need to start saying it more. 
You don't have to know all the scriptures. It would be great if you did. You don't have to have a theological degree to be able to walk somebody through the plan of salvation. Somebody just needs to hear from you that you used to be bound and now you're free. They used to be blind and now you can see. You used to be lost and now you're found. That's what they need to hear. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Talk about it. Whosoever includes me. Anytime the Bible says whosoever, I'm included. Look at your neighbor and say, you're included. You're in that. You're a whosoever. That includes you. There's great whosoever's in the Bible. Verse 13 of this scripture we just read to you. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I love this scripture because it makes it plain and it makes it simple. You can go to 50 different churches today and get 50 different explanations about how to get saved, how to stay saved, what you need to wear, what you need to do, where you need to go, how many times you need to do it, all this stuff. But the Bible says in verse 13, whosoever, which includes me and you, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We rename the church, the church of the whosoever. I think that would be good. And we make it our point to just not add to. Anytime we add to with our own stuff, it confuses and it mars and it blurs. No, let's keep it plain. Let's keep it simple. Whosoever, it means it doesn't matter what your past looks like. It doesn't matter what your present looks like. It doesn't matter if you're rich or you're poor, you're popular or unpopular, got a job, don't have a job, whatever. It says whosoever. So how do I get saved? What do I do? Call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. What does it mean to be saved? You ever had anybody ask you that? I've had somebody ask me that before. Somebody had never been in church. You don't find many of those in the Bible Belt. The problem with the Bible Belt is we got everybody's, everybody's saved. <laughs> don't everybody want to serve, but everybody's saved. Everybody knows Jesus. You never see them, but they know Jesus. But I had somebody ask me, what is salvation? What does it mean to be saved? Saved from what? That's what they said. What am I saved from? What does it mean to be saved? What's that, what's that about? Well, first off, he saves me from me. <laughs> you need that. You're killing you. You are. Every day. <laughs> when the devil's looking for devices against you, he doesn't look, have to look too far, does he? just gets you to look in the mirror <laughs> Paul summed it up like this in Romans chapter 7 oh wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from the body of this death in my flesh I'm against God in my mind I'm against God it's only when I'm walking in the spirit do I flow with the spirit in my flesh there are days I'd like to sleep late and not even come. Anybody else? You better say amen because half of you do. <laughs> but the Spirit of God within me wants more. The Spirit of God within me is pushing me. The Spirit of God within me is leading me so that my flesh doesn't drive this car. Because when my flesh drives, I crash and I burn. But he saves me from me. Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to save me? Jesus is going to save you. That's who. I want to get to the, I want to get to the heart of this. I want that praise team to come. Come back, praise team. You haven't been sitting down long. Just come back. Come back. I want you to listen very closely to this last part and I want to give everybody the opportunity today this is in case you didn't know this is the most important thing that we do we ever do is lead people to Christ 
this is the most important thing. It's more important than any message I preach, any song that we sing, shout or not shout, whether or not someone speaks in the Spirit. It's more important than anything else we do is whether or not someone who is lost gets saved. Because He saves me from wrath. Wrath. W-R-A-T-H. Wrath. And I just want to tell you, these scriptures break my heart. I would love to take all these scriptures out. But you can't take them out. They're in there. Although if you're not careful, and I'll say this as a side note, you need to be careful who you're listening to with the word. Because there's a movement of preachers that's taking hell out of the Bible. And you can't take it out. It's in there. It's in there. I, don't get me wrong. I'd love to take it out. If you could take it out. But you can't take it out. It's in there. The devil uses a twisted truth. That's what I want to call it. It's not, it's not just a flat out lie. It's a twisted truth. It's a lie, but it's like a truth that's twisted. And he uses it against us. He uses it against believers and unbelievers. And this is what he does. When you sin, when you fail, he speaks into your heart. And he says, God is mad at you. God is angry. God has had it. He is upset. God's going to... God's going to handle this. It's a twisted truth. See, the Bible tells us that God is a God of wrath. Wrath is included in God's attributes. And God does have anger. If you read the Bible, you'll see several places where God got angry. It's not pleasant. But what the devil is not going to tell you And what he's going to try to keep you from hearing right now, so open up your ears so you can hear. So he don't want you to hear this. All of God's wrath and all of God's anger that had to do with your sin, he poured it out on his son. I still can't understand it. That he had so much love and so much wrath at the same time that he loved us so much. And he hated sin so much. You say, why does he hate sin so much? Look at what it does. Sin kills. It destroys. It rips families apart. And that that makes God angry. It's wrath. So he loved us so much. And he's angry at sin so much. At the same time that he poured his wrath out upon his own son. For every sin that we have ever committed past, present, future, every sin of the whole world was poured out on Jesus Christ. So when he whispers that in our ear, it's a twisted truth. Yes, God was angry, but he poured it out upon his son. For those of us that have trusted Christ, the wrath of God has already been poured out upon his son. The Bible says about us that we are not appointed to wrath. The Bible says, just right after Paul said that, oh wretched man that I am, what how am I gonna what am I gonna do with this body of death? Just two verses later, Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. God's wrath has been poured out upon his son. So God's anger has been pointed in that direction. That's the good news for us that know Christ. Revelations 20 and 15 gives us the bad news for those who don't know Christ. It says, and whosoever, and there's another whosoever, was not found written in the book of life, cast in the lake of fire 
The Bible talks about hell a lot. A lot. Jesus talks about hell all through the Gospels. The Bible says that hell is a place of eternal fire and torment. It's a horrible place. And whoever hasn't trusted in Christ, that's where they go. I wish I could change that, but I can't change that truth. You see, there are going to be people in hell that were one time famous. There are people in hell that, that didn't have any friends in this life. There are people there that were rich in this life. And there are people there that were poor. Being poor don't get you into heaven. There are people in hell that lived a horrible, wicked life. There are people in hell that lived a good moral life. Can I tell you something that will blow your mind? There are some people in hell that lived a better life from start to finish than some of the people that will be in heaven. The thief on the cross, he lived his whole life against God. He was a murderer and he accepted Christ. Jesus said this day you'll be with me in paradise the rich young ruler on the other hand came to Christ he said I've kept the Ten Commandments from my youth all the way up but he couldn't give God his whole heart there are people in hell today that's lived a better life than I've ever lived but they never trusted Christ and there'll be people in heaven trophies of God's grace who lived their life running, rebelling, sinning, but one day they saw the light, one day they accepted Christ in their heart, and His grace overwhelmed them, His love covered them, and His blood washed away their sins, and in heaven today they're a trophy of grace, that righteousness can't be achieved, that righteousness can only be believed, and whosoever could be you, if you're ready to trust Him. Every, let's all stand, every one in hell will share one common trait. They never accepted Christ. And everyone in heaven will share one common trait. They all trusted in the blood of Jesus Christ. This is a very important day for you. Is your name written down? Is your name written down in God's book? You might say, I think so. And I just feel in my heart that there's several in this service today that you would say, I think so, Pastor Jonathan. Well, this is what I would say to you. Are you going to stake your whole eternity on a think so? If I was you, I wouldn't. I want you to leave today saying, I know that I know that I know that I'm saved. I know without a shadow of doubt that God's blood, that the blood of Jesus Christ has washed my sins. I know that I know that I know that I know that my name's written down in that book of life. I know. As they sing a couple lines of this song, if you don't know, or if you think so, I'm going to ask you to come and just kneel down. And we've got some ladies and some men that will pray with you. Today could be the biggest day of your life. Today could be the day that your life changes. Today could be the day that you become the righteousness of God.